Welcome to lecture 4, Dominant American Cultural Patterns. So, today, Ahmara Lurazova, I'm going to introduce you with a topic. In this lecture, together with you, I will distinguish cultural patterns, summarize the reasons for the diversity of religion in the USA, and you will compare, contrast American cultural values and your native cultural values, discuss the American norms and work and feel, feel in the Jamboard. What is cultural pattern? Pattern at a fair high level of abstraction, there are substantial similarities in the patterns of culture found among different groups of men, that is, there are traits common to all cultures. This universal culture pattern may be expressed in terms of the following. All people have a family system, all have a language, all have developed some sort of system relating food, clothing and shelter. Every social group has some kind of government and patterns of social control and property systems and inheritance rules uh, are found all in all lands. People in all groups worship a higher power. We may suggest in this way still other universal patterns of culture. If we consult an encyclopedia for the definition of the word a dominant culture is a cultural practice that is dominant within a particular political, social or economic entity in which multiple cultures are present. It may refer to a language, religion, ritual, social value, or a social custom. These features are often a norm for an entire society. It achieves dominance by being perceived as pertaining to a majority of population and having a significant presence in institutions relating to communication, education, artistic expression, law, government, and business. The concept of dominant culture is generally used in academic discourse and fields such as sociology, anthropology, and cultural studies. The culture that is dominant within a particular geopolitical entity can change over time in response to internal or external factors, but one is usually very resilient and able to reproduce itself effectively from genera generation to generation. In a polycultural society, various cultures are celebrated and respected equally. A dominant culture can be promoted deliberately and by the suppression of minority cultures or subcultures. In the United States, a distinction is often made between the indigenous culture of Native Americans and a dominant culture that may be described as WESP, white, Anglo-Saxon Protestant, Anglo, white, middle class, and so on. Some Native Americans are seen as being part of the culture of their own tribe, community, or family, while simultaneously participating in the dominant culture of America as a whole. But we distinguish other American groups. Ethnic groups are, to, are said to exist in the United States in relation to a dominant culture, generally speaking, uh, generally seen as English-speaking or uh, European ancestry and Protestant Christian faith. Asian Americans, Jews, African Americans, Latinos and deaf people, among others, are seen as facing a choice to oppose the opposed by assimilated into accelerate or otherwise react to the dominant culture. Culture is like an iceberg. The tip of the iceberg is the smallest part. Most of the iceberg is submerged. The same is true for a climate and culture. That which you can easily see the behavior of people in the smallest part of culture. It is external while the greatest part, internal culture, is beneath the water level of awareness. It is inside people's heads. The internal culture includes our way of thinking and perceiving. Most importantly, it contains the values and belief unconsciously learned while growing up in a particular culture. 
These values and beliefs determine most behavior. The illustration above represents two cultural icebergs coming together as people come together from different cultures. Note that the largest part of, the, of a person's culture is internal or beneath the water level of awareness. As the two icebergs collide, most people would see the difference in behaviors. Some people say that the United States is a melting pot, though it's not a melting pot. So what is a melting pot? If we consult the dictionary, so the definition is a melting pot is a place or a situation in which people or ideas of different kinds gradually get mixed together. This metaphor, which is often used to reflect this assumption, is the melting pot. People from around the globe bring their cultures here and throw them into the American pot. This mixture is stirred and heated until the various cultures melt together. There is some truth to this idea. The US is a cultural diverse society. However, there is also a dominant culture, and immigrants become a part of this culture by giving up their differences so that they could fit into the mainstream of society. A more historically accurate metaphor is that the US has had a cultural cookie cutter with a white, Anglo-Saxon, Protestant, male mold or shape. Let's have a look at the history of the United States. In the early 1900s, a German Catholic, Catholic immigrant could learn English and blend into the Protestant Christian community. He might change his name from German to a typical Anglo-Saxon name. Wilhelm Schmidt became William Smith or simply Bill Smith. Those who could feed the cultural cookie cutter mold advanced more easily and quickly than those who could not even even today the most economically successful Arab Americans are Lebanese Christians because they are Christian while most other Arab Americans are Muslim. They could more easily fit into the dominant American culture. Beliefs in the USA First, religious pluralism and diversity. Second, various native beliefs of the pre-colonial time. Third, church attendance in the United States today is very high. Example, 94% of Americans expressed faith in God, 70% of Britons and 67% of the Western German expressed faith in God. Almost 80% of Americans surveyed report that religion is very or quite important in their lives, while only 45% of Europeans, on average, give similar answers. In the United States, we can see the percentage of Protestants are 70, Catholicism 20%, and, uh, and others uh, have the minority. What do Americans value? Americans value individualism, equality, informality, the future, change and progress, achievement, work, action and materialism. How do Americans express individualism? The most important thing about Americans is probably their devotion to individualism. They have been trained since very early in their lives to consider themselves as separate individuals who are responsible for their, for their own situation. They have not been trained to see themselves as members of a close, knit, tightly interdependent family, religious group, tribe, nation or other collectivity. They like to make their own choices and express their opinions. Most of the children are brought by Dr. Benjamin Spock's famous book, Child and Baby Care. They have the concept of themselves as individual decision makers. Americans believe themselves as an individualistic, self-reliant, independent person. They like an atmosphere of freedom. 
Americans see as heroes those individuals who stand out from the crowd by doing sometimes first largest, most often or otherwise best. Examples are aviators Charles Lindbergh and Amelia Eckhart. Americans admire people who have overcome adverse circumstances, for example, poverty or physical handicap, and succeeded in life. Black educator uh, Booker Washington is an example. The blind and deaf author and lecturer Helen Keller is another one. Many Americans do not display the degree of respect for their parents that people in more traditional or family-oriented societies commonly display. They have the conception that it was a sort of historical or biological accidents that put them in the hands of particular parents, that the parents fulfilled their responsibilities to the children while the children were young, and now the children have reached the age of independence, the close child-parent tie is loosened, if not broken. Here you can see the examples of American individualism in speech. Do your own thing. I did it my way. You'll have to decide that for yourself. You made your bed. Now lie in it. You don't look out for yourself. No one else will. Look out for number one. Americans are also distinctive in the degree to which they believe in the ideal, as stated in their Declaration of Independence, that all men are created equal. Although they sometimes violate the ideal in their daily lives, particularly in matters of interracial relationships. Americans have a deep faith in some fundamental way all people, at least all American people, are of equal value, that no one is born superior to anyone else. One man, one vote, they say, conveying the idea that one person's opinion is as, as valid and worthy of attention as any other person's opinion. This is not the to say that Americans make no distinction among themselves as a result of such factors as sex, age, wealth, or social position. They do. Is informality. Informality is relaxed and fairly behaviors, speech, or wearing styles that don't follow any strict rules or ceremonies. I really like Americans' wearing styles. Jeans, t-shirts are so popular even among celebrated leaders like President Barack Obama, Steve Jobs, or Mark Zuckerberg. What impressed me a lot is that American high school students are very free to choose clothes when going to school. In my university and almost other schools in the US, students usually dress comfortable clothes such as tank top, shorts, t-shirts, etc. Firstly, I felt a little bit embarrassed and surprised by this wearing style, but gradually I think if everyone feels comfortable, what you wear doesn't really matter. In addition to free dress code, the way of behavior is very informal. The environment in the classroom of US schools is more casual than what I thought. It's common for students to eat junk food when lectures are being delivered. If you need to go out or come in, you don't need to ask for permission. A handshake is usually used when meeting someone for the first time, no matter what his or her age. It's also used in more professional settings like an interview or between professor and staff members. When greeting, Americans usually hug, slap, and to say, hi, hey. Hi, Jacob. Hi, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Thanks for having me. Bye, Jacob. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. In general, presidents are careful in keeping their good images in public. However, President Obama can be the fly in a TV show. Hey, get out of here. That's the most persistent fly I've ever seen. Nice. Living in America, 
I realized that Americans are also informal in speech by using a lot of slang, swear words, and idioms. Greetings and farewells are usually short, informal, and friendly. Hey. Hey, Anthony. What's up? Hey, Rachel. What's up, Rachel? Hey, Veronica. Hey. Morning, guys. Hello. Greetings. Hey, what's going on? Hey, man. What up? No. no. When you ask what makes us the greatest country in the world, I don't know what the fuck you're talking about. When public speaking, formal expressions are commonly used, ladies and gentlemen, as a greeting, then speakers will have loads of introductions about themselves, some names, organizations, etc. Nonetheless, in America, speakers just have short and simple greeting. Hello, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. All right, everybody, go ahead and have a seat. How's everybody doing today? Informality, the unique culture of the USA, reflects equality in American society, and. It's also the belief in the constitutional phrase that all men are created equal. Informality is not a sign of disrespect, but it narrows the gap among people of different ages and social positions. That's why, just after a short time living here, I can integrate into the environment, make new friends, and learn better. The land of equality with welcoming, friendly, and open people. That's beautiful America in my mind. America, an ideal destination for people to study, work, and live. It's not only because of its great economy, favorable educational environment, and good living condition, but the most significant factor is equality created by. Americans are generally less concerned about history and traditions than are people from other old societies. They can say history doesn't matter. Many of them will will say this. It is the fa- future that counts. They look ahead. They have the idea that what happens in the future is within their control or at least subject to their influence. They believe. That the mature, sensible person sets goals for the future and works systematically toward them. They believe that people, as individuals or working corporately together, can change most aspects of the physical and social environment if they decide to do so, make op- appropriate plans, and get to work. Changes will presumably produce improvements. New things are better than old ones. The long-term slogan of two major American corporations capture the Americans' assumption about the future and about change. A maker of electrical appliances ended its radio and television commercials with the slogan "Progress is our most important product." A huge chemical company that manufactured, among many other things, various plastics and synthetic fabrics, had the slogan "Better things for better living through chemistry." In addition to this, fundamental American belief in progress and a better future contrasts sharply with the fatalistic Americans are likely to use them. That term with a negative or critical connotation, attitude that characterizes people from many other cultures, notably Latin, Asian, and Arab, where there is a pronounced、uh, reverence for the past. In those cultures, the future is considered to be in the hands of fate and God, or at least the few powerful people or families that dominate the society. The idea that they could somehow shape their own future、uh, seems naive or even arrogant. Here is a hard worker. One American might say in praise of another, or she gets the job done. The expressions convey the typical American's admiration for a person who approaches a task consciously and persistently, seeing it through the successful successful conclusion. 
Americans tend to define people by the jobs they have. Who is he? Or he is the vice president in charge of personal loans at the bank. The family backgrounds, educational attainments, and other characteristics are considered less important in identifying people than the jobs they have. The willingness of the individuals to take risks is a basic aspect of the American culture even today. The American dream of economic advancement and success is still shared by immigrants today. And I'm here to give you guys an interesting lesson about 25 cultural norms in the United States. So what do I mean by cultural norm? Well, I mean things that Americans do that are probably a little bit weird in other countries. I've traveled a lot. So I have a good idea of what's normal and also what doesn't really happen in other countries, at least not as much as it does here in the United States. So let's get started. So the first few norms that I have for you guys are actually involved in restaurants and eating out. I'm sure the most common one that you guys know is tipping. So here in the United States, I think waitresses and waiters get paid only a few dollars an hour. Normally minimum wage is at least $8 an hour here, but waitresses can get like $3 an hour, something crazy low. In order to make up for this, people who go to restaurants will tip the waiter. A normal range to tip is 15 to 20 percent. I like to always tip 20 percent because the person needs money so that they can eat and live. Another thing that we like to do in the United States is separate checks. So when the bill comes, sometimes in Europe everyone pays together. And it doesn't really matter if you're on a budget. It doesn't matter if you're trying to save money because if somebody else in your group actually has a much more expensive meal, you have to pay the same amount as everyone else. Everything is combined into one check and you all split it equally in that group. However, in the United States, a lot of times, even with a big group of people, everyone will pay for their own meals. Sometimes couples pay for each other. That's a different story. Normally, either one person will pay or a few people will pay for each other but it's not common for people to really just split it down the middle. People will normally only want to pay for what they had and what they ate. Another thing at restaurants is that we like to give lots of ice and that we offer free refills. So we normally have really big glass sizes and then on top of that, if you drink all of it, well, we'll give you a refill for free. But that's not something that we do with alcoholic drinks, not normally anyway but this gives an opportunity for people to gain a ton of weight because people oftentimes drink sodas, which have tons of sugar, and then you can keep refilling that soda one after another, and then people might drink way too much, too many calories. Another thing that can help people gain weight is the fact that our portion sizes, the food size in the United States is massive. So this is another cultural norm. We like to have quantity. Quantity, not always over quality, meaning that we like more, not better. That's not always true, but we definitely like more always, especially states like Texas, where they say everything is bigger in Texas. Something else that we do is we ask for all of our leftovers to go. So because we have such big portion sizes, a lot of times, if you're a small person, you can't eat all of that food. So what happens to it? Well, we don't want to waste it. So we take that leftover food home with us. So we ask to doggy bag it or a to-go box. So this is super common in the United States. You go out to eat and then you have food for the next day. So really when you pay for a meal out, it's like you're paying for two meals. Another norm that I never noticed that someone actually told me about and I ag agree with is that we like to eat food on the go. So we will go through a drive-through in our car and we'll eat food in the car. 
Or if you're in a big city, maybe you'll eat a sandwich while you're walking down the street. In other cultures, this is very strange because food is honored and you go home for an hour during your workday and maybe you even eat with family and friends. In the United States, it's really normal to eat at your desk. It's also equally normal to eat while you're walking. It's not that strange. So the honor of eating food, uh, the honor of that practice is not really there. We love food, but we don't necessarily always make it an event, especially for meals like lunch and breakfast, which are not as important and are normally, you know, eaten on the go because we're so busy. Talking about being busy, we are really overworked here sometimes. Not everybody, but some of us here have really hectic schedules and are always running around. And sometimes we don't really have the time to go grocery shopping or to cook for ourselves. So besides eating out, something that we do is we like food box services. So each week they will deliver a big box of a ton of ingredients and it's all portioned out and the recipe is right there and all you have to do is cook that meal right then. So every week you're basically getting your groceries delivered to your house but already in recipe form. So it's a really convenient way to cook from home and eat fresh food, but not have to go out and do the grocery shopping and plan all the recipes yourself. So while I was living outside of the United States, something that I thoroughly enjoyed was the fact that tax is included when you're making a purchase in, with anything outside of the US. So in Europe, when I saw that this mouse was $25 at the store, I knew it would be $25. Well, not dollars, but maybe euros. After viewing the video about American cultural norms, you should use the following link, discuss it, and fill in the Jamboard. So we can draw the conclusion that Americans plays great importance on progress and change. From the culture's earliest establishment as a distinct national entity, there has been a diffuse concentration of beliefs and attitudes that may be called the cut of progress. This belief and attitudes produce certain mindset and a wide range of behavior patterns. Various aspects of this orientation are optimism, Receptive, receptivity to change, emphasis upon the future rather than the past or present, faith in the ability to control all phases of life and confidence in the perceptual ability of the common person. Belief in progress fosters not only the acceptance of change but also the conviction that changes tend in a definite direction and that the direction is good. The superficial friendliness for which Americans are so well known is related to their informal alliteration approach to their people. This behavior reflects less a special interest in the person addressed than a concern for showing one is a regular guy, part of a group of normal, pleasant people like the college president. Listen carefully to the lecture and be ready to answer the following questions. Question 1. What may the universal culture pattern be expressed in? Question 2. What are the cultural values of the American social group? Question 4. What do Americans say about history? Are Americans collectivistic? Last question. Do Americans violate the ideal in their lives as it is stated that all men are created equal in the Declaration of Independence. I will attach the links to the following YouTube videos in the description so that you can get a clear idea of the whole video.